Carol Matriciana. In this series, we'll be looking at church history, its struggles past and present, and comparing the origins of the first church of Jewish believers, roughly 2,000 years ago at Pentecost in Jerusalem, with the present day beliefs and practices of the emerging apostate church entrenched within evangelical Christianity. The emerging new Christianity, with its eclectic spiritual embrace, is gaining momentum in the church at large and within evangelical ranks in particular. Its far-reaching influence is embedded in many mainline Protestant denominations and Christian organizations worldwide. Its fostering of Christian unity, inspired by Roman Catholicism's original promotion of union with all people of all religions and cultures, is today evident in its adoption of New Age mysticism. While emerging new spirituality rejects many of the Bible's teachings, it publicly presents itself as evangelical Christianity, a new Christianity for a new world, offering a spectrum of spiritual techniques, psychological methods, pagan health alternatives, and liberal coexist solutions attractively covered with Christianese for what is called a rediscovery of the true heart of Christianity. In April of 1942, they came together in St. Louis, Missouri, less than 150 prominent evangelicals came together at that time. And they determined that evangelicals needed to unite just as the federal Council of Churches had united. That was a very liberal portion of the church that would be called today the religious left. In the early 1900s, 30 Protestant denominations met in New York with a plan of federation to promote the spirit of fellowship, service, and cooperation among Christian churches. In 1908, the Federal Council of the Churches of Christ in America was founded. Its idealistic goals encouraging unity and peace and justice between various denominations is commendable, but difficulty continues as those working together hold to different interpretations of the Bible. The result is seen to be that doctrine is divisive. Yet, doctrine is a vital aspect of biblical faith. If unity is the goal, liberalism becomes the solution. So evangelicals purpose to unite to focus on issues other than social justice, social gospel issues, to focus on biblical authority, evangelism, salvation, to focus on primarily eternal issues. Not that feeding the stomach isn't important, but they claimed feeding the soul was far more important and this little band of evangelical Christians marched forward and morphed into what would become National Association of Evangelicals. A lot of the mainline Protestant denominations were heading left, even though they had been sound a hundred years before that. And they knew that these mainline Protestant denominations would someday spiritually implode because of their focus on strictly social gospel issues. The social gospel um, was actually developed about a hundred years ago by some um, men who believed that we needed to further the brotherhood of all mankind and that the mission of the church needed to become simply what we do here on earth to meet people's physical needs. It omitted the whole spiritual aspect of salvation and exchanged for it doing works of charity. Emerging Christianity's expanding political intentions incorporate global perspectives and appeal to a wide section of churchgoers whose faith is being neutralized by involvement in liberal friendly programs. These are seductively courting Christianity into left-leaning politics and claiming it's a biblical mandate. Starting in about the 1990s, the whole movement, including the National Association of Evangelicals, had shifted so far left, it's almost unrecognizable. 
There were a number of things that came together to assist in this, including periodicals like Christianity Today. Christianity Today was at one time the publication of choice for every evangelical. I remember as a young person uh, waiting for my copy of Christianity Today because it was something that was solid, it was something that was Bible-based, it was something that was cutting edge, and it featured personalities and theology in about the 1980s. It was disquieting to see what we had always trusted begin to lean to the left. By the 1990s, Christianity Today was promoting a lot of the social gospel issues, including poverty, immigration, and I think the most troubling was that Christianity Today abandoned their real allegiance to the nation of Israel. And it was probably under the influence of a very successful man of propaganda, Yasser Arafat, who swayed Christians around the world. Christianity Today began to lean towards pro-Palestinian cause. And when you have national Christian evangelical leaders suddenly saying, maybe Israel did overstep their bounds. Maybe Israel really needs to give up this territory and this territory. And frankly, if they would do that, there's a much greater chance for peace in the Middle East. And out of the mouths of the CT editors and writers, it was a little bit stunning. People can be led away by degrees through the influence of false prophets and false teachers that are in the church today that the Lord Jesus and the apostles all warned about would come, especially in the last days. People can be led degree by degree, step by step into a place in their lives where they have strayed from that narrow path. They have strayed from the plumb line of God's word. and. That is a very dangerous place to be in and the, and the problem is the heart is deceitful even for the heart of a believer it can be deceitful and so we can be influenced by wrongful um, influences wrongful powers even that will cause us to change the way that we think and the way that we feel about what the lord requires for us as as christians in the world today In the 60s, the Roman Catholic Church forwarded a movement in political theology which became known as liberation theology, suggesting that the church at large needed to liberate the poor from unjust economic, political, or social conditions. The World Council of Churches that had already begun to form in 1948 has been at the forefront of seeking world unity through Christian service. It is the broadest and most inclusive global movement, comprising of 349 denominations and church fellowships in more than 110 countries. It represents 560 million Christians, including most of the world's Orthodox churches, Anglicans, Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, and those from Reformed churches as well as united and independent churches. The Roman Catholic Church, the world's largest church body with over a billion members, is using the World Council of Churches to forward its own religious doctrines, political agenda, and ecumenical mandate to people of all faiths, including those diametrically opposed to biblical Christianity. In 1975, at the World Council of Churches Fifth Assembly in Nairobi, Christian churches were introduced to the idea that humans are to blame for climate changes, natural disasters, and other environmental problems. The World Council of Churches appealed to all nations to cooperate with mutual commitment towards caring for the earth and its management. A new shift in Dominion and Kingdom Now theology was set in place. I believe it's extremely important for American evangelicals, most of all, to witness to the changes that we are making ourselves in our churches and in our political life to support climate change. But we want that message as American evangelicals to be heard on the world stage. Richard Sizak 
former vice president and spokesman for the National Association of Evangelicals, has been on the cutting edge of keeping environmental concerns at the forefront of evangelical social action. In his extensive travels promoting earth care, Sizak claims Bible passages support that earth management is the church's mission, the same progressive agenda that, not surprisingly, is forwarded by the liberal World Council of Churches. Richard Sizak is a very left-leaning evangelical. He came along um, in the 1990s, and he's tried to take evangelicalism as we got to know it. He tried to take it back into the social realm. He tried to take it back into social gospel issues. He also wanted to focus on what was going to become the new mantra of evangelicalism, environmental issues. Today, if you go to some of the uh, websites of the evangelical movements, you will see that probably one of the biggest things that is being promoted would be the whole environmental agenda. I have to say that the gospel of environmentalism is based on junk science because there is absolutely no scientific proof that any kind of global warming is any more troubling than the global cooling that happened in the 1970s. This is a cyclical thing that happens in normal environmental cycles over many, many decades. These things go back and forth, cooling, heating, cooling, heating. But I think the danger that happens is that people get into a mode of actually considering the Earth sacred, calling the Earth Mother Earth. I think people would say that evangelicals would never do this. But then why do we have organizations such as Restoring Eden, Evangelical Environmental Network, the National Association of Evangelicals, promoting the whole environmental cause and global warming creation care. The idea of the earth being sacred is part of pagan nature worship. The term Gaia comes from ancient Greek, meaning earth is the primordial goddess. In India, where I grew up for almost the first 20 years of my life, motherhood itself is elevated as goddess, and so is the land of India. Mother Earth is to be appeased through various worshipful sacrifices if she is to provide bountiful supplies. At the heart of Hinduism, the religion of India, it is believed feminine energy or mother goddess is the originator of the cosmos. Hinduism's adulation of earth as the giver of life is worshipped in the concept that this life force is God itself. It's a God consciousness believed to be the essence of all life. It is said to dwell within everything and everyone as divinity and that all is oneness and deity. The Bible teaches otherwise. Man and cosmos are not divinity or part of holiness that belongs only to the Creator God. It teaches that the personal God of the Bible, the Creator of life, the earth and all in it, keeps life held together by His hand. He provides rain and is in control of the environment. He is its sustainer, regardless of man's attempts to appease other gods. The Evangelical Environmental Network has published a book, Global Warming and Our Risen Lord. Do people really think our risen, now reigning Lord is focusing today in heaven above on the issues of the global warming agenda? Of course he isn't. We begin to establish almost a form of pagan Christianity, of pagan spirituality, if we let this go too far. And I see the environmental networks doing this, letting it go too far. I do believe that Christians have a responsibility to care for creation. The Bible says creation should be protected, but it should not be glorified. It should not be put on almost an altar of worship. And when I go to a, a major website and I see environmentalism and creation care as the dominant message. I get very concerned that we are getting our eyes off of what the founders of evangelicalism wanted to focus on back in 1942, 
and we get our eyes onto issues that are peripheral and issues that really don't matter for eternity. Heresy is essentially error. It is something that does not line up with the orthodox Christian faith. It is uh, something that divides. That is the, the essence of the meaning of the word, it is to divide. So it is something that does not have a basis in truth. Whereas apostasy is a veering away from a position that was once good, that was once in line with scripture. It is when Christians deliberately choose to reject or ignore, turn their back upon what they once believed. And what they once believed was the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the whole counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation. And so people will deliberately make that choice not to accept the truth that they once held to. That is apostasy. We do not know the meaning of the word evangelical today. It is maligned. It has been twisted. It no longer means to stand for preaching the gospel, winning the lost, sending our missionaries to the four corners of the earth, focus on saving souls. The social gospel includes environmentalism and uh, things that they would refer to as stewardship. Their view is that we're somehow going to um, see the kingdom of God. It's going to need to be ushered in by our efforts. God's not going to come back to earth unless earth has got its act cleaned up. Dominion theology, in a nutshell, is the idea that man can build the kingdom of God here on earth before Jesus comes, that by our human efforts we will bring back Jesus. This belief that it is up to the church to bring in the kingdom of God, it is up to the church to Christianize society, it is up to the, up to the church to reform the world in which we live. No, no, no. The Bible teaches that the world is a sinking ship, that things are going from bad to worse, and that the only hope for this planet and every person on this planet and all the nations of the earth is Jesus Christ. It is his return. When the Prince of Peace returns, then there will be peace. Then there will be righteousness. Then there will be justice. But not before, because the Lord told us and the apostles told us there's a man of lawlessness coming. The spirit of lawlessness has always been in the world. John tells us that in his epistles. The spirit of Antichrist has always been in the church with deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Jesus said on one occasion, will the Son of Man find faith upon the earth when he returns? Implicit in that question is the answer, no, he will not. And that is what the Apostle Paul says, the love of many will grow cold. The kingdom of God is not something that we build. The Bible teaches that the kingdom of God is something that we inherit because it's already built. And the way that you enter into that kingdom is through his son. It's through the person of Jesus Christ because you've been forgiven of your sin. That's not the message of the social gospel. The social gospel doesn't even address that because the social gospel doesn't believe it. It's Jesus who sets up his own kingdom. And we are the ones who inherit it, and it, it's always been designed. It's God who has always had designs on the kingdom. It's Jesus who ushers it in, not the other way around. We don't usher it in for him. In the dominion mandate, the social gospel becomes prominent because the church views its mission as changing actual things here on earth. It's not a heavenly focus, and it's not about salvation, but it's about changing man and man's institutions and structures the modern Dominion theology movement, although ostensibly evangelical, has many influences that have affected its doctrines and its teachings, and some of these influences go back hundreds of years. Dominionism really gets its fuel from what's called post-millennialism. Post-millennialism is one aspect of what's called Kingdom Now theology. It's the idea that there will be a kingdom on earth that's built by the church prior to the return of Christ. The word millennial really means thousand. And the idea that we are in the kingdom now comes from a misunderstanding of when Jesus came to earth offering the kingdom to the Jews. He said continuously, 
that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand. The Jews thought he was bringing in a governmental kingdom when Jesus was offering himself as the kingdom. Disciples of the first church, who'd been with Jesus from the beginning, had witnessed his death on the cross and his resurrection, and were taught by Jesus after his resurrection about Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled on him, they'd also watched his ascension into heaven, and they were the first to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit as promised by the Father at the fullness of the first Pentecost. These were the first evangelists who proclaimed to Jewish thousands still remaining in Jerusalem after the Passover that the new covenant was in Jesus Christ. In one day, 3,000 Jews, after repenting of their sins, were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. They fully understood from their scripture teachings that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the new covenant, and the fulfillment of the eternal kingdom of God. The Bible teaches that the kingdom of God is going to be the last thousand years of human history. Jesus will return again, and he himself is going to come with the armies of heaven, come with the bride of Christ, the church, and set up a kingdom here on earth. During this kingdom age that Jesus will bring, there will be long lives again. Many parts of the curses that came with the fall of Adam into sin will be reversed. The animal kingdom will get along with uh, humans. Enmity will be removed in the kingdom that man is now trying to construct in these various movements. All these religions coming together through the various efforts that man is making to set up a kingdom for God on earth, he actually is working towards bringing in the kingdom of a false messiah who will set himself up as God, claiming that he is God, and the deceived will follow this false messiah to their destruction. The message of Coexist is a powerful political message that pulls at the hopes of all people everywhere. Many cultures are longing for better life situations, and most religions claim they offer peace. Some offer it through mystical escapism. The true mission of Christian churches worldwide should be to offer transformation and hope through the gospel of salvation found in Jesus Christ on the cross. Yet many churches today are exchanging this and offering all kinds of consumer-friendly solutions that only attract materialism. Or they're offering pagan spirituality and suggesting its hopes will bring peace. To find consumer-friendly techniques in many of these different churches appeal to a very sensual, very worldly aspect of what they consider postmodern man. Postmodern man being the man who has thrown off all restraints, who is very eclectic, wants to bring in bits and pieces of different religions, where this can meet the felt needs of the people. You see it in many of these different churches. Rick Warren's Saddleback Church with his purpose-driven reformation is a big one, appealing to young people. Programs, approaches, technologies and techniques that will help them build a big empire in the church, to build a new kind of church appealing to the individuals in the community, and by so doing, bringing down any emphasis on the gospel or the solid objective source of truth of the word. Pastor Rick Warren, with his new reformation, is seeking now to bring his peace plan into a global perspective where he hopes to recruit a billion people who will bring about a solution to the poverty and the illness and the ignorance that pervades the world and that will bring about justice from a governmental position and get rid of all the unjust and un unfair leadership of the world. Rick Warren feels his peace plan will bring about world peace and solve this problem if all men gather together 
and decide we are going to set aside our differences and work to, to make the world better. In an interview, Pastor Rick Warren talked about what has happened in the church over the last hundred years. He said at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a great split in evangelical Christianity. That there was the group who believed that the gospel was about promoting good, the social gospel. That uh, utopia was here on planet Earth and that we could attain it through good works. But at the time the split occurred, there were those evangelical Christians who said, no, that's not the gospel. The gospel is about understanding who Jesus Christ is and what he's done and going to heaven based on a relationship with the Creator. Well, Pastor Warren said he believes that both sides are correct and that they can be brought together. When you study the ministry of Jesus in the New Testament, Jesus did five things. He promoted reconciliation, he equipped leaders, he assisted the poor, he cared for the sick, he educated the next generation. And so we began to go out and began to plan how to do it the way Jesus did. As I went out and began to speak about peace, everybody else wanted to be, wanted to be involved too. When I went to the Davos World Economic Forum, when I spoke at the United Nations, at Congress, and Cambridge, and Oxford, what we learned is that people wanted to be a part health partners and business partners and government partners said, can we be a part of peace too? We're beginning a coalition of partners. And this is what the whole Purpose Driven Movement is about, is looking for ways to bring a social change on planet Earth, to eradicate AIDS, poverty, illiteracy, and other major problems that the world faces, a very noble effort. But is this the gospel according to the scriptures? Absolutely not. The gospel, according to the scriptures, is understanding who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Now, according to Pastor Warren and others who promote this idea of the purpose-driven concept, they say that if we just do good, we can change the planet. There are many who are working very hard to bring about a better earth. And in and of itself, that's not a bad thing. We're to pray for our rulers that we may have peaceful lives and peace on earth in our existence day to day and in political situations. But it is an illusion to think that by our own human efforts, we're going to do what only God can do to bring true peace on earth. Jesus Christ is the one who is the Prince of Peace. He alone can bring true and lasting peace. So even though it is a good thing to feed the poor and to clothe those who are naked and to feed the hungry and to try to bring about solution to the illnesses and the ignorance and to, to fill the emptiness that people fill. If you are doing it through a worldly plan where you are joining forces with those who are not believers, as Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, is seeking to do through his global peace plan, how can you fill the spiritual vacuum that he recognizes is one of the great ills of the world by giving them a watered-down gospel and a counterfeit God. There are actually major streams of dominionism in the church, and each stream focuses on a different aspect of dominionism. We have very active political dominionists who actually want to take over various aspects of government. They believe that by building the kingdom of God on earth that they will take over um, actual state structures. There's other streams of dominionists that focus more on uh, the cultural mandate, which would be the social government. Gospel. In fact, it's actually tied historically to the old social gospel that came in through the Protestant churches in the last hundred years. The more conservative realm of dominion theology that expresses itself in, in patriotism and in the idea that Christians really need to infiltrate human governments. And then we see another side of dominionism that's expressed more in the charismatic realm where they believe they need to be praying the kingdom in. That when Adam and Eve fell, that they lost dominion over the world and that Satan now has dominion over the world and that the church needs to be regaining this territory back. Jesus taught that he was the kingdom of God the new covenant, and that he'd begun a new epoch with his first coming and earthly ministry. He said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. He removed the consequence of original sin with the shedding of his blood on the cross and extended God's grace to all. 
The real mission of the church is to evangelize the lost, to bring to repentance those who need to be saved, to convict them of, of their sins and bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. The church is changing its form and its function so that it no longer is about the gospel of salvation. It's no longer about evangelism. You don't see people going door to door with tracts or sharing about how Jesus saves. Instead, you see the church being changed into a community center in which the church meets all of your life needs. The modern church is definitely a place where people who want to be busy, can be kept busy 24-7. They can go there and literally be there every night of the week doing some sort of an activity for everything from yoga and exercise to um, learning how to cook. The church becomes a social institution for people in the seeker-sensitive environment. You see the church doing social work jobs, going out to, as a community agency and helping the poor and doing all sorts of um, community service activities. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a church engaged in helping the poor. But the modern church is systematizing this. The modern church is turning this into a whole program the new mission of the church has become seeker sensitive and the church is actually going out and becoming a cultural center. No different than your grocery store or your arts center in your town or the community center where you would do recreation, not the place where sinners get saved and no one-on-one -on -one witnessing and evangelism. Dominionists focus on thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But Jesus said that my kingdom is not of this world. What believers are to be doing today as ambassadors for Christ is we are to be going out to the whole world, giving the life-saving message of the gospel to the world and gathering citizens for the coming kingdom of Christ. Many parts of the church believe we're in the kingdom now as the church taking control of the whole world when what the Bible teaches is that Jesus in his second coming sets up his own government, his own kingdom from Jerusalem and he will rule and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords here on earth for the last thousand years of human history. The cultural mandate is the soft cell, soft core dominionism, is what I often refer to as dominionism light. And it appeals to a wide variety of people. Many people involved in the cultural mandate don't even understand how they're actually tied in with the dominionism dark people who have a violent military form of dominionism that they want to implement. The cultural mandate is about changing people's worldviews. It's about changing structures of societies and making them appear more Christian. It's about influencing culture. In a lot of ways, the cultural mandate is the same as the old social gospel that was popular in the Protestant churches in the first half of the 20th century. It was a way of meeting people's physical needs which the church really should be doing of food, health care, that kind of thing. Uh, but it didn't present the gospel too. And that was one of the chief problems with the original social gospel, and it remains a problem for the cultural mandate. It's about earth. It's not about our future home in heaven. We have many examples down through history where men have uh, implemented or attempted to implement uh, what they thought was Christian, what they thought was biblical. Less than 400 years after the first Feast of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit filled believing Jews in Jerusalem, the powerful political Roman Empire sanctioned Christianity as its state religion. Some 50 years prior to its legalization, it had already been gaining favor with the Roman Emperor Constantine. He basically started the modern Roman Catholic Church the idea was that we could set up a kingdom. That led into things like the, uh, the Holy Roman Empire. We even have among the reformers, John Calvin in Geneva setting up a utopia, a Christian society in Geneva. In his book, The Right to Heresy, Stefan Zweig writes, Calvin was called the Protestant Pope. 
the dictator of Geneva, and that his plan was to convert Geneva into the first kingdom of God on earth. The whole of his life was devoted to the service of this one idea. Augustine originated the system of government for the Roman Catholic State Church, which former Roman Catholic John Calvin continued to apply in his reformed model, forcing residents of Geneva to attend church services and take the Eucharist, a Roman Catholic version of the Lord's Supper. These days we have ideas like kingdom dominionism, that we can uh, set up a kingdom, that we can go by laws, or we can go by highly spiritual people who will transform the earth. And these were ideas that had some biblical relationship, but they were contrary to what the Word of God teaches. Historically, religion has been used to control the masses and often to make their devotion to God synonymous with devotion to the state. Today's cultural mandate is blending church and state with the idea that Christianizing society will improve world conditions and bringing cultures under the law of God will make society more moral. In 1980, I was part of the Lucerne Movement's World Congress on Evangelization, sponsored by Billy Graham's Evangelist Association. Graham wanted to unite all evangelicals in the common task of the total evangelization of the world. At the time of attending Lucerne, I was a young born-again believer unfamiliar with the nuances of biblical Christianity versus Protestantism and Roman Catholic ecumenism. I attended the conference along with well-respected Christian leaders and trusted their discernment in these matters. Almost 900 Christians representing churches and Christian organizations from around the world gathered to consider ways of reaching the unreached. I was excited to be part of what I thought was a strategy to communicate the biblical gospel of Jesus Christ. We were allocated to work in small groups. There were 17 mini consultations and our goal was to provide information we'd gathered from our various ministries over the years through our own personal experiences. My area of expertise was in reaching cult members and those embroiled in New World religions that proliferated in the 60s and 70s. I thought Lucerne's goals, like my own, was to bring unreached people into a biblical relation with Jesus Christ through discipleship programs, but I learned differently. The hundreds of us present were part of an immobilization system to promote a new evangelization distinct from personal evangelism. It was a subtle programming, but one I'm grateful to have been personally part of. Lucerne was all about promotion of a Christian heritage as part of a global nationalism, the blending of church and state, and political correctness under the guise of biblical Christianity. It states the essentials of a belief in the God of the Bible, but allows diversity and opposing principles into the ranks of the church. We were to represent Christian moral behavior and advance a social gospel of works without personal evangelism, which we were encouraged to think was a more seeker-sensitive method but the Bible stresses discipleship through communication. This, we were told, could be divisive. The cultural mandate really rose to prominence after the first Lausanne Congress that was held back in the early 1970s. The cultural mandate actually came from the reformed branch of the church and it was a revival of some of the aspects of Calvinism that applied the church to be in charge of the actual culture around the church including society and even the government of that region. The cultural mandate became a way for the church to switch over from the gospel of salvation where we repent of our sins and accept Jesus into our heart. Instead we supplanted that with a 
a mandate to go out and change the culture, to win people to Christ and get entire countries to change and entire people groups to change, to get people to change their beliefs. But it wasn't about the gospel. It was about dynamics, structures, institutions. In 1980, Taking part in the indoctrination program of Lusanne's world evangelization, when I look back on it, was a powerful experience. Hundreds of us felt a certain unease but couldn't quite put our finger on our apprehension because the deceptive weapon being used was one of semantics, the mishandling of the proper understanding of the meaning of words that were being changed before our very eyes. Now, armed with biblical discernment, I'm able to understand the emotion manipulation and deceptive scripture twisting that was taking place. But at the time, being with hundreds of like-minded vulnerables, we were caught up in the idealism of being disciples for Christ in a special world plan. As Christians, many of us truly loved the Lord and were unaware that we were being used as dynamic change agents for the mobilization of a new system over people groups, which is quite different to our biblical mandate to disciple the lost into an awareness of their sin and their need for a personal savior in Jesus Christ. My heart goes out to the hundreds and thousands of Christians worldwide who think they're part of spreading the gospel of Jesus when really, like I was, they're caught up in the deception of churchianity or new global strategizing that is leading millions to destruction. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I hope you found Volume 2 helpful in understanding the problems and pitfalls of the new emerging Christianity. And I invite you to watch out for Volume 3 coming soon from Carol Productions, which will explore the new apostolic reformation, the signs and wonders movement, Christian Palestinianism, and more. For further information on these and other subjects to help you discern the times in which we live, as well as for additional resources, including books, DVDs, and my autobiography, Out of India, please visit www.carrilltv.com. Thank you very much.